write a song. All right, but if this love is not playing by the time mom and daddy get home, somebody's going to be in big trouble. If this song isn't written by Saturday, I'm going to be in trouble. Now, I don't see what's so hard. All you got to do is combine this part with this part. suggest I play quite well. Uh, we, we had Legos, and one of the things that you find when you have Lego blocks, especially in a home where you have five children, uh, like the home where I grew up, uh, is that over time, uh, you lose Lego blocks. I don't know where they go, I don't know uh, what happens uh, to them, but one thing I do know is that if you have Legos, over time, playing with Legos, you lose some of those Lego blocks. Uh, but I thank God for my mother, because it seems to me that almost every Christmas, no matter what else was under the tree, there was always uh, a fresh deposit 
of Lego blocks. Uh, but what happens is that over time you begin to discover that the things that you used to build, you cannot build anymore. Uh, I used to build this police car. Uh, but building a police car involves a lot of blue and white Legos. Uh, it involves the axle piece uh, for the Legos. It involves four wheels. And over time, uh, somehow something happens to the blue blocks. And you look up and you've got all these white blocks and you can't find uh, any more blue blocks. And, and, and somehow four wheels turn to three wheels. Uh, and I know I had four wheels, but now I only have three wheels. Uh, and, and I got all these purple Legos now and there's nothing purple on a Chicago police car. And so I, I'm frustrated here. Because I'm used to building the police car with blue and white blocks and four wheels. And all of a sudden, I've got purple blocks and only three wheels. And I can't find my blue blocks. And that can be frustrating. But if you're like me and you're good at Legos, they didn't have Lego land when I was growing up. I would have chose that for a career. Every time I go there, I say, I could build that giraffe. I knew I can but as an enterprising Lego person, what you do is you begin to imagine something totally new. Something that is, you know, purple and white and three wheels. Now instead of a police car, I got a purple and white ATV. Are you with me about myself? And beloved, life is that way. It's happened to me too many times, I think, in my short span on the earth. I remember being in high school, uh, and for four years of high school, I devoted myself with all seriousness to Navy Junior ROTC. Uh, because I had it in my mind that after high school, when I graduated from Whitney Young, uh, I was going to go to the Navy Academy at Annapolis. Uh, after I finished the Academy, I was going to get a law degree. Spent 20 years in the Navy as a judge advocate and then run for the Senate. I had it laid out. Until one day, through circumstances and prophecy, the Lord told me, you're not going to the Navy. Camp. And you're not going to the Navy at all. You're talking about somebody who I already knew what clothes I was going to wear for the next 30 years. I literally, like, I didn't realize it until I was walking through it, but when that thing began to change, I had to figure out how do I dress? Like, what's my style? Because I was going to be in uniform for 30 years. I didn't need to have a style. Do you, are you with me on my back? So I get on into the new thing and I get with my dear friend and we're writing music and plays and producing music and plays and doing great. I mean, we had grants to, to do youth programming, teaching youth how to write plays and, and do music. Running the youth program. We were like 19 and the kids in the program were like 15. <laughs> and, but we were grant funded, you know? We were doing well until one day we weren't. Are you with me about myself? And it was clear with me and my dear friend that one of us dear ones was gonna to have to get a regular job. But God, through the entertainment stuff, had opened up a door back into something that I had already been involved with before, into politics and civics. And I got a job, and the next thing I know, I was just, I was not a playwright anymore. And I was not a stage performer anymore. I was a political. And had to sort that thing out. And by the time I got it good and settled and had my consulting firm going and making good money, the Lord says, well, it's time to go past the church. And at every step, why am I talking about this? Because at every step, beloved, there was this requirement to just reimagine the whole thing. Because living a life as a 
entertainment person. It's late nights. It's writing. It's the whole different crowd. It's listening to music. And in, in politics, you got to go to bed early because the meetings start at 6 a.m. And I mean, it's, just, it's a whole different flow. Yeah. You go from wearing jeans and gym shoes every day to suit and tie. You gotta buy a whole new wardrobe. You gotta change your language. The lingo is different. Uh, 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 the, 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 the acronyms mean something different. I promise you I'm going somewhere with this because many of us, beloved, are living right in that spot right now. Things are not what they used to be. Things are not what they used to be. And that can be devastating and frustrating. Because as humans, we love constancy and sameness. And if it could just stay the same, we would be all right. But one, the most constant thing in life is change. And many of us have come to this place where, where I came to with my police car, where all of a sudden, all of the things that I used to build with, the stuff that I used to make my life with, those relationships, those skills, those uh, 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 material things that I used to depend on to build my life, I don't have access to them anymore. Plus, it's all This, this 
arrogant God. We see him as this kind of bloodthirsty assassin out to get the Christians. But that's not the Saul of the scripture. That's a made up Saul based on, I don't know, we needed a bad guy or something. But Saul was not the bad guy. He was killing Christians. But Saul was not the bad guy. Let me tell you about Saul. Saul was a devout Jew. Saul was a Pharisee. Now, when we hear Pharisee, we think about the governmental Pharisees that uh, Jesus dealt with in the Gospels. But a Pharisee literally is just a group of Jews who believe in the resurrection, opposed to Sadducees, who are Jews who did not believe in the resurrection. So Saul was a devout Jew. He believed in the resurrection. He was an intimate student of the scriptures. Now, we're talking about before Jesus here, so you can say that Saul was as close to Jesus as he could be without the resurrection. Because he was intimate with the scriptures and Jesus is the living word. He was intimate with the scriptures. He was uh, believing in the resurrection. Saul was a humble servant. When, when they stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7, we meet Saul, and Saul's activity at the stoning of Stephen is that he is watching people's coats. Now, if Saul was a bloodthirsty, arrogant assassin, and we're stoning one of the deacons in the church at Jerusalem, Saul would have been the one to push his way to the front of the crowd and say, let me throw the first stone, and let me make a speech about how messed up these guys were. But Saul, that wasn't his personality. He said, y'all got this, I'll watch the coats. Saul, the text tells us in Acts chapter 9 that Saul went and sought passage from the chief priest to go to Damascus. Now, I'm just saying this. Saul didn't need permission to go to Damascus. Saul didn't need permission to go to Damascus and, and beat up on Christians. Going to the high priest and asking for permission to go to Damascus would have been like 1942 in Mississippi going to the sheriff and asking permission to lick somebody. He didn't need permission. But he wanted to be submitted to the structure and the leadership. Saul went to say to the high priest, all this is going on, but is it okay with you that I go to Damascus and go up in the synagogues and start persecuting people? Because even though they're wrong and even though they're heretics and even though we all want them gone, I'm not going to go in the synagogues and do anything without permission from the high priest. And the implication is, had the high priest said, no, Saul, now is not the time to go to Damascus, Saul would have saved himself right there in Jerusalem. Are you with me by myself? Saul was a devoted guy doing all of the right that he knew to do. And what Saul needed was to reimagine, because the only thing that had happened is that things were changing around Saul. Somewhere in Saul's life, Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth and was born uh, of a virgin and grew up 30 years, preached three years of ministry, went on the cross, raised up from the dead, separated the veil, and all these thousands of years of doctrine have been moved forward in a significant way. And there's a lot of stuff going on around Saul, and Saul couldn't put it all together yet. Jesus says to Saul on Damascus Road, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, a cattle goat is a pointy prick that they would use to move oxen as they plow. Oxen get lazy and distracted, so they poke the ox to make them keep moving, keep plowing. And sometimes the ox would kick back and it would just hurt the ox more because it was pointy. So when he kicked it, it would stick him more deep. And what Jesus was saying to Saul is, Saul, I know that you got a sense that things are changing. But you're so committed to the old way that you just going to pile forward in the old way. And I'm over here with the cattle pro trying to move you a different direction. I keep poking you this way and you keep kicking me, Saul. Stop kicking me. Something is changing. Something is different. 
but you don't know how to get yourself in the new. Right, right, right. See, we, we can sing about a new season and shout when we talk about a new season, but the reality is, as soon as stuff actually starts changing, it's like, I didn't realize, Prophet Chris, when you said change, that you meant change. You meant like actual different. But it's not you, love. It's the human condition. So what we see here in the text, and I'm going to get right to this and get right through it, but we see four Component of a Holy Spirit led reimagining here with Saul. The first thing we see is that Saul had to see the Lord. You see, under the Holy Ghost, this is reimagining oneself as opposed to like, you know, Hollywood makeover or something like that. Right? This is reimagining. This is reaching down deep and getting a whole new vision of oneself. Getting a whole new vision of what's happening. Getting a whole new vision of what can be. It's more than getting a new wardrobe or changing how you wear your makeup. It's more than quit your job and go get another job that you hate equally from the job that you quit. This is not about a makeover. This is about a deep reimagining under the Holy Spirit. And so that always has to start with a fresh revelation of God. It always has to begin with seeing something more in Him. And beloved, it doesn't matter how long you've walked with the Lord or how short you've walked with the Lord. I guarantee you, you have not exhausted the possibilities of God. There is still a lot more about God that you don't know. There's still a lot more about God that you have never seen. There's still a lot more about God that you have never experienced. And so when there is a fresh revelation of God, it does not mean that it is not God. Now, I didn't say a new revelation. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's nothing new in God. It's new to you. He was always everything he is. And he will always be everything that he is now and always has been. He is God. He does not change. But so magnificent, so glorious, so inexhaustible is his person that the 24 elders around the throne for eternity never do anything except for cast their crowns down before him because he is so magnificent. And they bow their and at some point they feel like they have worshipped that aspect of God enough so they look back up at him and see something completely different and have to cast the crown again and bow their faces to the ground again and worship that aspect and they just do that in all eternity. So your little 40 years of walking with the Lord, beloved, you have not exhausted God. And every time it is time with a fresh revelation of the Lord. He will show you himself in another way. Beloved, it's not about the pieces you have. It is about what you see. Do you see the Lord? See, that's where reimagining starts. Your life is frustrated. It's too much new and not enough old. You don't know how to put it together. But beloved, stop busying around with the pieces for a minute and begin The next thing we see in the process, when you see the Lord, also don't see the familiar. The biggest opposition to reimagining oneself is the old version of oneself. It doesn't matter how good or bad your life has been, you would rather have the same than different. Let me say it again so you can settle this in your mind and your heart. It doesn't matter how good or how bad your life has been. You will rather have the same instead of different. And so in order to truly reimagine, you've got to begin to ignore the familiar. Now, I used to have a consulting firm I was telling you about. And one of the things that we did in the firm was what we call organizational transformation. 
So people would hire us to come in and help them turn that organization around, reimagine that organization. I was the CEO of the firm. I usually had the meeting with the executive director or the CEO. First meeting, in order for Citizen to work with you to reorganize or reimagine whatever we call it, the transformation turnaround, first meeting, you've got to promise me this. This organization is going to change or close down. The one option that we do not have is stay the same. So we're either going to change or we're going to close, but we will not stay the same. Because if you won't commit that to me, I know from the first meeting, this organization is not getting ready to change. You have not given up on the old yet. You still looking for something to come out of the old part. And so I don't need to spend my time or take your money talking about transformation and turnaround because you ain't transforming and you ain't turning around nothing because you still stuck at the old thing. So promise me and sign your name on a document that says we either doing transformation or we shutting the doors, but this place is not staying the same. And beloved, it's the same thing with the Holy Ghost. You've got to close your eyes to the familiar. Because as long as you can see what it used to be and smell how it used to smell and hear how it used to sound, then you'll never even pursue something different. That's right. God shined the light in Saul's eyes and made him blinded to his physical surroundings. So he can't see a man who was rolling with him down to Damascus to persecute the Christians. He can't see the Damascus road. He can't see the synagogue in Damascus. He can't see uh, the robes of the priests. He can't see whether the Christians are wearing the robes or not. He can't see if they got the little thingy on their head. He can't see who's got sandals and who doesn't have sandals. All of the stuff that he would use to show up and assess the situation is not available to him right now. He's got to begin to see with the, the spiritual eyes. He can't see the familiar. Beloved, it's not about the pieces you have. It is about what you see. Are you still looking back too much? Are you still remembering too much the good old days? Beloved, let me tell you about the good old days. They were not that good and they are too old. Stop looking at the familiar. Stop. God is trying to get you to, to, to write it. This is probably, this is prophetic. Somebody's trying to write, but you just keep reading what you used to write. And God is trying to move you in a whole different writing direction. You're not going to ever write like that. Hear the Holy Ghost. You're not going to ever write like that again. Jesus. Forget about that. But if you start to reimagine your writing, you get ready to do something that you would never have been able to come up with in this old paradigm. God will release to you a whole different approach to writing. God will release to you a whole different set of topics to write about. You might have been writing something that was like a how-to, and you get ready to become the greatest creative writer of all time. You don't know what God is about to do, and you will not. said, not only should I not see in the familiar, let me start trying to see in the spirit. Okay. God gave Saul a gift of blindness so he couldn't see the familiar. But Saul said, I, I understand what this is. You want me to see in the spirit. I'm going to add to my blindness faster. So now not only can I not see with my physical eyes, I'm not going to take physical food. I'm not going to feed this flesh at all. Jesus. I'm going to totally disengage from this physical realm because this is about revelation. This is not something I'm going to figure out on a scroll or looking at somebody's face. I got to see God. So I'm going to take it a step further past blindness. I'm going to start fasting. Because now I've got to see in the spirit. And Saul really began to see in the spirit. Verse 11 when Jesus is talking to Ananias. He says to Ananias, 
Arise and go to a street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarshish. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias. You see, beloved, when you start disengaging from the flesh, you'll start seeing in the spirit. When you start disengaging from the flesh, when you get off Facebook for a minute and don't watch so much TV for a minute and maybe turn down the plate for a while and start to quiet down all the urgings of this flesh, you begin to see in the spirit. Saul began to see the vision. Because he gave himself to fasting and prayer. He said, there's a man down on the straight street. He's fasting and praying. And he's seen a vision. Beloved, I promise you. The Bible promises you. If you seek the Lord, you will find him. If you seek him with all your heart. God is not a God who does not desire to be found. God deeply desires to be found. And he promises us, if you seek me, you will find me. All you got to do is get to seeking and you will find me. Even if the enemy tries to block me out or hide me, if you seek me. Beloved, I heard a testimony of a man who was living in a closed country. I can't think of the country right now, but he was living in an Islamic country, in an Islamic family, never seen the Bible, never seen a Christian. But was seeking God. Something down on the inside of him was saying, this is not all that there is. He wasn't seeking God. He was seeking Allah. Because that's all the God he knew. But in his heart, he was saying, I want the real God of the universe. Do you know that just like Jesus showed up to Saul, Jesus showed up to this man, in a closed country and preached the gospel to him he had never seen a Christian. That's how much God wants to be found. All he's looking for is somebody who will seek him with all your heart. And God's promise is if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all of your heart. Beloved, it is not about the pieces you have, it is about what you seek. Can you see in the spirit? The reason entertainment industry is blowing up like it is, and I'm, I'm in my seat, I promise I'm finished. But another word for entertainment, or at least a bad version of entertainment, is what they call amusement. That word is amusement. A anti. Muse, think, consider. Focus. Anti thinkingness. And this is why the enemy is trying to use the, the technologies that God gave us to reach the world and pervert those technologies so that we sit up there like a bunch of dumb zombies zooming through videos about how somebody eat a donut. It's just anti thinkingness. I want you looking at a dog chasing his tail so that you won't be considering the things of God. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. And what Saul did was cut himself off for a minute from all the anti-thinkingness yes. so that he could see in the spirit. The last component of this, beloved, is let others see for you. Hallelujah. Even after you have seen the Lord and even when you have closed your eyes to, to the familiar and even when you are seeing in the spirit, you still need some help. Amen. The men on the road had to help Saul get to Damascus. Saul went blind on the road. If you look at Damascus, I should have put a picture up there. It's a very rough terrain. Not good for a blind person to try to travel, especially somebody who just got blind. Saul needed somebody to show him to Damascus. God told him, Jesus said, go into the city. But there was not a good way for Saul to get from here to the city unless somebody helped him on the way. Somebody had to see the way for him. 
Then God says to Ananias, go and lay hands on the brother so that we can open his eyes. You see, God was showing Saul the vision, but he showed Ananias the process. He showed Saul the vision, but Ananias had the process. You won't listen to your leaders because, you know, he don't study what I study. What does he know about accounting? He's not an accountant. What does he know about what I'm going through? Beloved, God will show you the vision. But you still need somebody to help you in the process. God will show you things, but he's not showing you everything. You still need somebody to show you on the way. You still need somebody to lay hands on you and pray for you and prophesy to you. You still need somebody to fellowship with you as Saul did with those saints at Damascus. Beloved, it is not about the pieces you have. It is about what do you see. So what do we do with all this? It's time, beloved, to take a step back and begin to see in the spirit. Reset is a fresh revelation. Reset is a fresh visitation. I keep apologizing for the length of our gatherings in this Reset series. And I suppose I will continue to do that because it's way past what we normally do. But the reason every time we put a mic in Prophet Jasmine's hand, heaven comes down. It's because Reset is a fresh moment. It's a fresh revelation of God. God is trying to show you something. And this is the moment for that. The response, beloved, is to step back and begin to shut down, disengage from the flesh. Maybe it's just one day. Maybe it's a week. Maybe it's a month. You know what God is saying to you. But it's time, beloved, to begin to see in the spirit. Because If you come out of reset, if you come through reset season and you're still the same, then you missed it. I am so different already that it's crazy. I said something to my wife the other day, and y'all forgive me for one more story. I was leaving the house, going to some meetings, and one of my boys asked me if he could go with And usually, it wasn't him. I know, that's, that's the end of that's not my kid. But one of my boys asked me if he could go. Usually, I'm not feeling Because my boys are little, they're little and functions, I'm going to a meeting, whatever. So I was thinking about taking him. Then I kicked against the pricks. I said, he's going too slow. I'm already late for the meeting. I got to go. We live in Beverly, the meeting was in Hyde Park. By the time I got to 55th and the Dan Ryan, I was literally in tears. Because my heart was so longing for him to be with me. And I'm telling you this because that is not something that has ever happened to me and is not something that would happen to me before this reset. But I was literally in tears. Because my heart was longing for him. God is doing something in me, beloved. God is doing something in you. And if you come through and reset the same, then you missed it. That is why God is saying this is a fresh moment. You can erase all of the mistakes. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter who you hurt or who hurt you. This is a fresh moment. This is a place where you can start over again with better clarity. Reset. 
And you probably were wondering why we gave you that way. But the reason we gave you those Legos, beloved, is to remind you forever as a memorial that it is not about the pieces you have. It is only about your capacity to see, to imagine what you can do with the Lego block. Beloved, you got some pieces in your life, and yes, they are very different from the pieces you used to have. I hear it in the Holy Ghost, somebody in this room who used to depend on your physical abilities. And you cannot physically do what you used to physically do. And you can hardly understand who you are because of these new physical limitations. But God says that reset is an opportunity to reimagine yourself. Because it's not about being strong like that anymore. God is getting ready to show you, beloved, that he didn't just give you a strong body. He gave you a strong mind. He gave you a strong heart. And you can live a life, hear the word of the Lord, that's not built on a strong body. You can live a life that's built on a strong heart and a strong mind. And all over this room, I promise, we probably need to have a prophetic, just a whole prophetic service. Because all over this room, there is opportunity to reimagine. And I'm talking about completely, totally, massive. Saul went from being a student and a devoted disciple. To be the greatest disciple maker of all time. When you really study out Saul, Saul was not on a leadership track. Became one of the greatest leaders. People who don't believe in Jesus, don't care nothing about the Bible, still use Paul to teach leadership. Where are you, beloved? On your Damascus. Because that's what reset is. God just broke into this congregation. Broke into my life. I was not anticipating it. I had not asked for it. And he just broke in. So I just want everybody to hold up this Lego block. I just want to prophesy to us for one moment. God, we release in this house. Even as you have given it to me to do at very important junctures in my life, and by your Holy Spirit, you brought me through it. I release into this house the anointing to reimagine. I release in this house the anointing to reimagine. By the power of the living God, I release you from your past. God releases you from your past. You don't got to worry about what people are going to think about you. Yeah, somebody's going to say you acting funny all of a sudden. You ain't acting funny. And you know they're not going to say acting funny. They're going to say acting funny. You acting funny. But you ain't acting funny. You have transformed. You have reimagined yourself and put the pieces together in a whole new way. Now let's just give God a shout of victory.